All right. Well, four weeks in to this series, uh, let me just remind you. First of all, has this series been helpful? Has it been good? Yeah? Good. I, it's been helpful for me, too. I, but let me just remind you, we're sort of halfway through all of this. Um, this series is building, right? It's, we're sort of layering, not that we're building up to something crazy, but it, it's layering these ideas on top of each other, right? So if it's your first time, you're just walking in on this series, it's okay. I'll, I'll fill you in a little bit. We'll do a little bit of review before we... <laughs> keep going. But if you haven't heard the first three messages, please do go back, try to listen to those this week. You can do that on the podcast or on our YouTube page, effie.church slash online. Um, Everything should be there, but definitely get all of that information. And I reference back to some things and uh, it's just, it's really important that you listen to them in order. I actually had an idea this week, and the last week of this series, it'll be the first week of October, um, what we're going to do is actually have a panel of people up here on the stage, and uh, they'll all have something to do with deliverance ministries, okay? They'll, They'll have some background in that sort of thing, which if you don't know what deliverance is, it's sort of helping free people from demonic oppression specifically. So we're going to end off this series with some real world experience. You can ask all the questions that you'd like. So over the next month, we're going to actually collect those questions. Um, You can go to the sermon notes page, fe.church slash sermon notes. You can find it on your app, or you can submit those in the back on paper if you want to throw a question in. Um, If there's something that you're wondering about specifically, we'd like to answer it. Okay, I might do so over the next couple of weeks left of the series, or at the end, we'll submit them to our panel. Um, So start thinking up some good ones, okay? Challenge us a little bit. Will you do that? Okay. Aaron will be up here, by the way. I mean, I know he's always up here with a microphone in his face, but he's usually singing. I think he might get a little preachy with this one, so it works. (laughs) We're excited. And also Mike and Jody who are sitting down here. And yeah, they've been really diving into this over the past year or so. It's, it's going to be a lot of fun. Really, really excellent stuff. We're going to wrap it up really well. So, okay. First week. Let me just do a little review. Ready for that? The first week we talked about how the spiritual world is real, right? How the Bible backs that up and it is more complicated than you may realize. But... Jesus rules over it all, right? There is hope. If you've dabbled in things that you maybe shouldn't have, there is hope you can get free. The second week, we talked about how all of this, everything that we're learning, has to be based in truth, right? The Bible is true. Any information that doesn't come from God might have a little truth in it. There there may be power there, but it's ultimately meant to what three things kill you, steal from you, or destroy you, right? That is Satan's three objectives. And so if the Bible doesn't talk specifics on something that you're wondering about, it might be because you're not meant to know it, right? Or at least not meant to focus on it. Focus on the light, not the darkness. We focus on the name of Jesus, not the enemy. Make sure what you're doing lines up with the word of God. Amen? Amen. The last week, this past week, We talked about how the breastplate or the body armor of righteousness is your covering, right? How you have to be living right, fully anchored in Jesus, not in your own righteousness, to receive his protection and authority. You can't be mixing ideologies with Christianity, right? Jesus is the only name powerful enough to conquer it all. So you can't be mixing Jesus with new agey stuff like tarot cards and sage or Hindu ideas like emptying your mind or even very religious works-based ideas. It is Jesus. There is hope in no one else. Yeah? So if we have our belt of truth on, our body armor of righteousness, right? What is the next thing that Ephesians 6 says we must have? Remember, it is the whole armor, not just a piece. We put on all of it, not just a bit of it. So what's next? What do we put on next? We're going to go to Ephesians 6, 
verse 13 today. I know we've read this every week, I think, but we're going to read it again. Ephesians 6, verse 13. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor, so you will be able to fully resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. I just want to pause here for a second because I don't think I've mentioned this yet. It says, after the battle. After the battle, you'll still be standing firm. So putting the armor on doesn't necessarily make the fight not come. After the battle. Right? It doesn't mean the the enemy can't bring a fight against you. I've told stories about my own house sort of being under attack in this series. It's not that being the the best Christian that you can be, putting on all of this armor, doing everything right, fully prevents you from being attacked. That's the world that we live in. It comes. It just comes. Remember last week, the Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust. This is the world that we live in. It is flawed. It is. But... After the battle, you will still be standing firm. So it means you will prevail in the end. The weapons may be formed, but they won't prosper. Isaiah 54 tells us, right? So after the battle, verse 14, stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. Here's where we're at today. Shoes. The shoes of peace, right? This metaphor here is what covers your feet. Now, remember, Paul was looking at Roman armor, right? I've said this throughout the series so far. He he was sitting in a Roman prison when he wrote this letter, looking at Roman armor. And so to fully understand his metaphor here, I think we have to picture this as well. The shoes he was referencing weren't just... How many of you picture Romans in like a toga and sandals, right? Toga parties or whatever, that's what we see Romans as. But Romans had armor, and that's what he's describing here. These shoes were actually armored as well. In fact, these shoes tended to have spikes on them. They were almost more like cleats than sandals. They had spikes on them. They not only protected your feet, but they gripped the ground too, giving you both a defensive position and an offensive position. And these shoes were meant to both help you run fast to escape pain and also be effective at inflicting pain on the enemy. Does that make sense? I think I've always thought, and I've preached the, the armor of God for as long as I've been in ministry. That's something you cover in kids' ministry. You know what I mean? <laughs> So I'm, I've preached, the, I've looked at the armor of God for a long time, and yet I think I've always thought that the only piece of armor that was offensive was the sword of the Spirit, which we'll get to in a few weeks, but I've been sort of rethinking that this week. The shoes were spiky. I don't know about you, but I feel like if I had spikes on my feet, that could do some damage in battle, right? Like, if I got an enemy down and jumped their head. That would hurt like a lot. Or I could do some sort of spin kick thing to the face. Not that I could do any of that. (laughs) But I'd like to think like in my head, I am really tough in my head. (laughs) Really cool, tough weapons like spiky shoes. So for some reason, I, I don't know, I was surprised by this and studying it. I thought that the shoes of peace would look more PC. <laughs> they look more dainty or something like, I don't know, little ballerina slippers or, or some, I don't know. But they're not, these shoes are not meant to bring peace to the enemy. They're meant to bring peace to the wearer, right? And it takes a strong person to maintain peace in their life, not a weak one. Okay, so I want you to keep this picture in your head as we go through this. They're offensive weapons as well. So not only are they weapons, though, but shoes are are about covering your feet, about having a readiness to do battle. You can walk on almost any surface with the right shoes, right? You're not going to go hiking in in flip-flops, but you're not going to go to the beach in ice skates, right? You need the right 
covering on your feet for certain situations. There's some shoes that are just more useful than others. And in the same way, you can walk in almost any situation with the right attitude of peace that comes from the good news we're talking about today. So again, it's both offensive and it's defensive. So what does that mean? What, what does that mean for the metaphor of peace? The more I got to thinking about this this week, the more I found and discovered having to do with peace and spiritual warfare. Uh, this is not a simple subject by any means. Um, so, so, so necessary to our everyday lives. Peace is something that affects each and every one of us on a daily, almost minute by minute basis. It affects us and we need to know how to receive it and how to maintain it. So we're going to look at the defensive piece of this first, okay? It really is the, the larger piece because here's the thing. God gives peace. It is something he provides. He gives it to us. Let me show you. Isaiah 32, verse 17. And this righteousness will bring peace. We talked about righteousness last week, right? Remember, these are building concepts. This righteousness will bring peace. Yes, it will bring quietness and confidence forever. My people will live in safety, quietly at home. They will be at rest. And all the introverts said... It's like my, my dream right there. Live safely, quietly at home. They will be at rest. My little introvert heart was like, uh, amen. I will take it. But God provides peace, right? The righteousness he provides brings peace. What does Psalm 23 say? We all know it, right? He is our shepherd. He makes us lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm at peace, Right? Or we could look at Philippians 4, verse 6. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace. We often miss the if-then statements in the Bible. We like the then part. We pick out the promise without the if, (laughs) right? Pray about everything. Don't worry about anything. Tell God what you need. Thank him for all he has done. And then you will experience God's peace which exceeds anything that we can understand. This is peace that passes all understanding. Exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. His peace. His peace guards your hearts and minds. Each one of these passages has sort of an implied if-then statement. If I see God as my shepherd, if I follow him like sheep, he makes me lie down in green pastures right? If he is my shepherd, his righteousness will bring peace. If you follow his leading, he will lead you beside those quiet waters. If you pray about everything and thank him for all he has done, then you will experience his peace. Peace that passes all understanding. We talk about this all the time, but we often want this brand of peace that is stormless, (laughs) We want no storms coming on the horizon. We want calm seas. That's what we think peace is. But this is peace that passes all understanding. This is peace in the midst of the storm, not in the absence of it. This is the, has nothing to do with the waters and the winds and the waves. They can be raging. You still have peace. God still gives peace. His peace will guard your hearts and your minds doesn't necessarily say your bodies, by the way, your hearts and your minds. So we can't have his peace without first claiming his righteousness, as I was trying to teach you in last week's message, right? God is the giver of peace and rest. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind or self-control. So God is the giver of peace, but... We must walk in it. God is the giver of peace, but we maintain it. Okay? As with most things in the kingdom, God gives it, but we still have a sense of responsibility here. Not giving us a spirit of fear, but sometimes we take it on. (laughs) Right? That is to say, there are a ton 
of counterfeit peace. Pieces. <laughs> peace. There's a ton of counterfeit peace out there from the enemy. Lots of practical stuff and lots of spiritual stuff. Okay, a full bank account, for example, tends to bring me peace. Amen? Right? I like to see a savings account, money to spare after the bills are paid. That feels like it brings peace to my soul. But there's a danger in relying too much on that. Because then I could become stingy, first of all, and not as generous as God has called me to be as a believer and a follower of Christ. Or I could lose all that peace in an instant when my roof caves in or the fridge dies or the car blows up, right? It's, things happen, and you, that savings account doesn't always say, stay saved, does it? Then, what am I left with when that's gone? If that's where I anchored my peace, and it's gone, then what? Right? Or, or maybe I'm just not willing to take the risks that God has asked me to take to fulfill his purposes, because my peace, my bank account, right? So I'll have peace, but only as long as that bank account is full. We all know life, it rarely stays full. So my peace is anchored in something that I will ultimately be a slave to. It's counterfeit peace. Just an example, some of us find peace in always having a relationship. Right? We don't like to be alone. And we'll compromise all kinds of our morals and our boundaries to have it. So there's physical examples of this, but there's also spiritual ones. And a lot of those physical ones are spiritual ones. They just come out more physically. But there are lots of spiritual, and because we're in a spiritual warfare series, there's lots of spiritual ways that we compromise our peace as well. That is, there is a way to live your life that creates and perpetuates the chaos, the fear, the confusion, the depression, those disruptive emotions and situations in your life that make it much worse. Satan likes confusion. He loves chaos because when things are confused and crazy... They feel overwhelming. You'll do almost anything to fix it. When you can't think clearly, you're vulnerable, right? And in a way, we almost need this. I think there's something beautiful about the way God is allowing us. This verse put it as um, in the time of evil, right? That we're prepared in the time of evil. We are currently living in a time of evil where God is allowing it to some degree, right? I think we almost need this to realize that there is something better, because remember, and I've said this so many times, but perfection never helped anyone. It didn't help Adam and Eve. It didn't even help Satan, who had perfection, right? He chose to leave it and pursue his own way. He thought there might be better out there, that he could attain God-like status. We almost need some of this chaos, some of this fear, some of living in this world to understand that God's way is so much better, right? And so... Satan loves confusion. Stress is so destructive. I was researching this a little bit this week. Stress is so destructive to our bodies. It is an emotional state that affects your body. And it's such a big part of most of our lives. Uh, stress can play a part in problems like headaches, high blood pressure, heart problems, diabetes, skin conditions, asthma, arthritis, depression, anxiety. It has huge effects on our body. Do you not think it has huge effects on your soul as well? Right? I briefly mentioned last week how some of these spiritual concepts have very real effects on our bodies. Physical health. Right? Couldn't be more apparent than this one. <laughs> the way that we rest... The way that we handle stress is actually incredibly important to God. Have you ever thought about God caring about your sleep? He cares. He cares. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy is guess which commandment? On one to ten. Just call out a number. Guess. It's not one. <laughs> I know I made it sound really important. It's number four. <laughs> it's number four on the list. Right? Don't serve any other gods before me. Um, don't use God's name in vain is number three. Number two is 
Somebody saying it. Don't have any other gods before me. I'm not going to think of it right now. But number four is remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. It's high up there. It was a big deal to the heart of the Father. Lack of sleep is one of those things that causes so much chaos in our lives. You don't actually survive very long without literally going crazy if you're not sleeping. Right? Satan often attacks you in your areas of peace and rest first. Right? He's something creepy crawly in the dark in your bedroom. You can't sleep. Right? He loves to mess up our rest. It's one of his favorite ways. And the spiritual versions of sacrificing your peace, they almost go much deeper and much darker. For example, we, we let these things run rampant in our lives. Say we're, we're grieving and grief can absolutely torture you. And so instead of running to God with those feelings, we want to reach out to the person that we're missing, the person beyond the grave. We want to feel their presence again and know that they're okay. So we might try out a, a Ouija board or a consult a poem reader or a medium or psychic, right? Because we want to feel that again. Mysticism and witchcraft bring fear. These are counterfeit versions of peace that people cling to when they're scared. They advertise peace. You have peace of mind knowing your loved one's in a better place. They advertise peace, but end up bringing much more fear and anxiety. Because again, what are Satan's three objectives? (laughs) Steal from you, kill you, or destroy you. And he's going to lie his way all the way to get there. So you might get information from those sources. You might feel like you actually touch base with your loved one, but there's going to be a harmful edge to it. Always. Always. Do you know what? We were talking this week about some of this stuff, and I've just started to sort of put two and two together, but it's, there's a gateway drug with some of this new age stuff, and it is crystals. Crystals. <laughs> Pretty rocks. Right, but we were talking about this this week, and a friend, somebody was saying that a family member, a young girl has been getting really into this stuff, and she's buying spell. Do you know you can buy spell books at Target? They're targeted to young girls as well. I literally looked this up just to <laughs> make sure that it's it's very popular right now to be a little witchy. Super concerning, <laughs> but this young girl got started into all of this stuff. Somebody gave her a crystal. Told her it has magical healing powers, right? Crystals really are a gateway to a whole lot of this chaos maker stuff. People that are into this stuff will claim that you need crystals for this or that, that this kind bring healing and this kind bring peace or whatever. Listen, I have never in my life said, man, I've been feeling really overwhelmed lately. What I need right now is a pretty rock. That's just, it sounds silly, to even, <laughs> to even say it, nowhere in the Bible, let me just be clear, does it say to consult with rocks for my protection? Jesus is my rock. That's what it says. I don't need any others. People who promote crystals are usually very heavily involved in the occult. <laughs> Buddhists also believe in crystals, but the popular stuff I see lately in American culture is really occult-driven new age driven. I was just doing some research this morning about what new age even means. It actually, it's interesting, it started to become popular in the 1930s through 1960s in America. And some woman who founded this movement in the 1930s prophesied that there would be a new age of spiritualism coming and it would it started in the 70s actually she turned out to be correct right we now know it as new age um it is a thing and here are their four basic teachings new spirituality new age stuff teaches everything is consciousness every person is god consciousness can be harnessed to achieve perfection i don't even know what that means Consciousness can be harnessed to achieve perfection. And the purpose is overcoming self. The four main things that New Ageism 
teaches. There are, you can feel threads of truth in there. There are pieces, but it's, the rest of it is so skewed and so dangerous. <sighs> that's, but that's what he does. That's what Satan does. I've been trying to talk about this counterfeit, this, the way that he twists truth, right? There will be a little bit of truth in there and a whole lot of lie to get you very, very off. The occult, the, the word occult actually means hidden. Occultism concerns itself with the study and utilization of supernatural influences, powers, and phenomena that are normally hidden from our physical senses generally considered to be outside the realm of traditional scientific observation. Occultists believe that human beings and the world in which we live are permeated by invisible mystical energies. You feel the truth in there somewhere buried? So do we, kind of. <laughs> we believe that the spiritual world is real and it's all around us, right? But they believe that these energies can be focused and directed by sacred stones, such as crystals or other talismans, so to induce physical healing and spiritual enlightenment. In addition to the crystal stuff, cultism is associated with other mystical practices like astrology, numerology, divination, tarot cards, psychic healing, mediumship, spirit channeling, Eastern religions, ritual magic, and sorcery. I want you to be armed with this information because a lot of us we take a piece, just a piece. Right? Somebody somewhere says, I'm spiritual too. I have this cool thing. And we, we take a piece of it and it, it's, it unravels in our life. It becomes much bigger than just the little thing that we initially bought into, right? The use of sacred stones for mystical purposes is actually nothing new in history. I was surprised to see it among the pagan people of the Bible lands, right? In fact, when I was reading some of this <clears throat> stuff on these other religions, for lack of a better word, uh, I was a little jealous, to be honest. There was like a little jealousy thing that came up. I, I thought for sure Judaism would have been the oldest religion in history. It's not. This stuff is. It existed before. I mean, we hear, you hear about it in the Old Testament. God speaking against other religions and other gods, right? Before he even set up the Ten Commandments and, and set Moses free. I mean, Egypt had a religion, right? But you don't think about it. Anyway, Ezekiel 13, verse 18. God utters a stern warning to these false prophetesses of Israel who in their apostasy had adopted some pagan practices of wearing amulets. It says, and I want you to see it on the actual screen. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Woe to the women who sew magic charms on all of their wrists and make veils of various lengths for their heads in order to ensnare people. Will you ensnare the lives of my people but preserve your own? I'm against your magic charms with which you ensnare people like birds. I will tear them from your arms. I will set free the people that you ensnare like birds. I will tear off your veils and save my people from your hands, and they will no longer fall prey to your power. <clears throat> Remember, we're not saying these things don't have any power. In fact, God himself uses the word power here to rebuke this stuff. <clears throat> there is power here. We're not saying it's not real. It's dangerous to say it's not real, but it's not from God. And therefore, it's meant to kill, steal, and destroy. It is power to unravel you. It wants to kill you. That is the point. It is meant to enslave people, to take over more and more of your life. Remember, the Egyptian magicians could produce magic tricks too. And this is what I'm talking about. Satan is good at counterfeiting God's works. What happens is you take a, pr a crystal for protection. You begin to put your faith in that thing. And soon it becomes, I need more. Because rather than warding off evil spirits or whatever they're supposed to do, they invite them. And so I need more to protect myself. This isn't enough. And like we went over in the first week of the series, Deuteronomy 18 forbids any of these practices, those who practice them become detestable to the Lord. 
So are these pretty rocks, are crystals, inherently bad? <sighs> they hold no spiritual significance over me, okay? Except for what I give it. It's something pretty in nature. God made pretty rocks, right? They're actually going to be in heaven too, and I wanted you to see this because it's amazing how Satan takes something and just counterfeits it, twists it. Revelation 21, verse 11 I don't know if I necessarily need to read it. I just want you to see all of the pretty rocks. Can you bring up that verse? <clears throat> Twenty-one, eleven, and 18 through 19. So many pretty crystals. There it is. Jasper and gold and 12 precious stones. Jasper, sapphire, agate, emerald, onyx, carnelian. I mean, it goes on. These are all going to be in heaven. In fact, there will be a city built on foundations of these things. It's going to be beautiful. And so Satan took something God made beautiful, and he twists it, and he convinces us we need it. It has power, not God. You can be on God's level by having some of this stuff, right? And in fact, they invite demons into your life because you're putting your faith in something other than God. It gives Satan a foothold. It's uh, the Bible word, but we sort of say the legal right. Now, it's essentially they have the right to come and mess with you. Bring fear. (coughs) And these are gateways into other things. People use them as an outreach tool almost. (laughs) They give them to people who don't believe. And well-meaning Christians take them as gifts and are almost afraid of them. They don't know what to do. They don't want to be rude. Ultimately, there is nothing to fear there. It's a pretty rock, right? A God-made rock, unless you begin to give it power. If a nice, well-meaning friend were to come and give me a crystal and convince me of its power, first of all, I'd match that energy and convince her of my God's power, too. And I guarantee you, the conversation probably wouldn't last long, although I'd be nice about it. But I'd say, look, I believe this stuff has power for you. I do. I know you're experiencing something real here. But I also believe you're being deceived. And eventually this power that you're experiencing will hurt you. When it does, you come and talk to me. Because I know a guy, right? (laughs) I'd be happy to tell you how to get free. How to live free. Jesus is the only rock you need. Listen, if you already have crystals or spell books or sage or tarot cards or Ouija boards or whatever in your home, either go home today, throw them straight in the trash, cast out whatever's on them, burn them to signify you're not going back, whatever. It doesn't have to be a ritual, but you have to signify in your heart it's done, right? I'm not going back. Again, the thing itself isn't dangerous. It's a piece of cardboard. It's a piece of... (laughs) Paper, it's, the thing itself is not dangerous. Crystals are pretty rocks. But if you've given it power or someone else has given it power by believing in it to some degree, you need to repent and renounce. Renouncing means to formally declare your abandonment of that thing. Formally declare it somehow. Some people do that by lighting everything on fire or throwing it in the trash and taking it out or you know, reject, stop using or consuming, right? That is to say sorry to God for going to something other than him for power and cast off anything from those rocks that is causing you torment somehow in Jesus' name. I'm giving you specific language. Go back and listen to this later if you, if you need to know how to do it because that's just it. We have the name of Jesus more powerful than any other name. But remember everything else we've talked about so far, and you have to be under his righteousness. You have to actually believe. It's not a ritual. It's not an incantation. Believe it wholeheartedly. You'll come to your rescue. If you've used any of that, you're inviting chaos and torment into your life. You're inviting demons into your life that want to steal, kill, and destroy you. What you're really trying to invite in is peace. God provides peace. God provides peace. <laughs> we maintain it. Okay, 1 Peter 3, 
verse 8 says, finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. Four, whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. Let me read that one again. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So this verse gives us a hint into how we maintain peace. We rely on him for peace, not anything else. It's not just about what we're not doing, like tarot cards and crystals and whatever, but also what we are doing. Okay? And I have some practical tips for us, just things that I, I have seen and observed the American church doing badly right now. Ways that we need to step up in order to maintain that peace that God wants to give us. So, <clears throat> number one, and I've actually been adding to these <laughs> all morning, so I don't have them on the screen. Number one, we, we have to live like he is our provider. Actually live. Like he is our provider. Not just say it with our lips, but live it. Stop going to other things for your peace. Stop anchoring your soul in anything else. Stop using the crystals and the counterfeit things and whatever for your peace. Peace, stop. (laughs) Act like he is your provider because he is. If you're being obedient. Tithing, for example. Tithe. Cast your worries on him. Let him, uh, I don't know how many people, when you're a tither, you can literally go to God and say, God, I tithe. You said, you said, bring the whole tithe. Test me in this. And if, see if I won't throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing. Like, you said, God, I'm tithing. You said, cast your worries on him. We take on all this worry, fear. It's not necessary. Cast your worries on him. I don't even know if I can articulate this, but I've been, as I've been going through the series, you know how you see things through different lenses when you read scriptures? Like day to day, you can read the same scripture and get something completely different out of it. But as we're going through this, the Bible uses the word cast a lot. You know what else uses the word cast a lot? Spells. Casting spells. It's just the same language. We have power. I mean, think of it as almost like a spell, not that you're manipulating God, which witchcraft is manipulation, right? That's why God hates it, because you're manipulating free will. That's the ultimate intent behind it. God gives free will. He gives freedom. Um, But it's casting. We have power. God gives us power to cast our anxieties on him. Give them away. Tell him about them as if he is a parent that you're relying on to give you food and shelter and clothing. He is. He wants that for you. Cast your anxieties on him. Pray about the things that bother you. He wants you to do that. He wants you to approach the throne room of grace with boldness. We get to approach the throne room of the God that created everything. The amazing power that God gives you. When all that comes from Satan is fear of that power. It's just amazing how we don't comprehend this, even as Christians. But we we also have to hold it in respect, our relationship with him. Think of it almost like, You treat your job with respect, right? Because it pays your bills. You show up on time. Uh, You show respect to your boss. You do what they say, right? Why treat God differently? He is my provider. So when he says show up, I'm going to show up. He says serve somebody, I'm going to serve somebody. When when he says tithe, I'm going to tithe. Otherwise, my world gets thrown into chaos, right? I get fired from my job if I treat my job badly, And I can't pay my bills. Everything falls apart. 
we should be treating that relationship with God with the same respect. Be obedient, and he will provide for you. A lot of us Christians are out here saying we believe these things, but our lives don't actually reflect it. (laughs) Are you lacking in peace? Go to him. It should be an indicator in your life to go to him. Are you lacking in joy? Go to him. Are Are you lacking in love? Go to him. Are you lonely, afraid, depressed, anxious? Go to him. Not anything else. Not any of the other counterfeits. Go to him. The second sort of practical thing here I see us doing badly as the American church is we are not practicing Sabbath rest properly. (laughs) To maintain peace, we have to be properly practicing Sabbath rest. This year, as a sabbatical year for me, um, and just if you haven't been here to hear the explanation, it's every seven years extra rest. It's a biblical, it's more farming term than anything. You let a field rest after seven years. Pastoring is so much like farming, <laughs> if you think about it metaphorically. But I have been learning this, this year all over again how to rest. It is a mindset, way more than it is something that you do. It is um, choosing to see rest in the right way. Now, again, it can be misused and be laziness, but choosing to see rest as productive. It's you're investing in something. You're investing in you, in your body, in your health, but also in your relationship with God. In fact, there, there's a big difference between just resting and resting in him actually trusting that he has your back, that you don't have to do it all, be it all, uh, be that you don't have to be productive all of the time. I, I know a lot of us Americans, we have this thing built in us where we have to be busy. In fact, when you ask somebody how they're doing, nine times out of 10, what's the answer? So busy, right? Whether we are or not, it's like we want to say it. So busy all the time. We, we want to be productive and we feel guilty when we're not productive. Worshiping God can also just look like enjoying the life that he's given you, enjoying the the people that he's given you, enjoying the gifts and the things and, and the family that he's put around you and thanking him for those. There can be rest in that. I've had to lay down a lot of work this year as a discipline, (laughs) but it has been such a gift, such a gift. Our brains can get so, um, it almost feels like rigid and hard. I don't know if that's like a scientific thing, but it feels like when you're super tired and you can't take in new information, like before you've had your coffee in the morning, right? And somebody tries to tell you, I can't comprehend it. Let me get awake first, right? But when you when you overwork for a very long period of time, you get this way. Your brain can't, it just can't take on new ideas, can't take on new things. The Bible says to renew your mind. We have to refresh ourselves. God gives us a, a blueprint for doing that. One day a week. Take one day a week. If you honestly would say that you can't afford to take one day a week, the job, the, the work, there's too much of it. I have to do, I have to go and I have to do and I have to do all these things. I, it's too much, God. You're asking too much. You're not serving God anymore. You're serving the work. The work is your God. And God will let you have it. He'll let you have it. And it's scary because... Work is not as consistent or perfect or big and amazing as God is, right? The work can't see what's coming down the line like God can. Can't see the, the famine that might be coming, the COVID that might be coming, the whatever. God can. And he'll provide for you in that if you let him. There is a line between work and worshiping work. God wants you productive. Don't get me wrong, right? We're not meant to sit around all the time. 
people waste away when they sit around all the time. We're meant to be productive. We have a purpose here on planet Earth. But there is a way to not worship work, to worship Jehovah, the provider. Work is not my provider. God is. And the Sabbath isn't just about resting, but resting in him. Resting in him, knowing that he provides, not me, not to take it back to the metaphor, not the ground in farming, right? Not the the earth that provides, but God provides. Not the workplace, not the office, not the job, whatever. He provides. There's, uh, we're not properly practicing Sabbath rest, and it gets us into all kinds of trouble. Remember, when we're overwhelmed, when we're tired, when we're stressed out, we're much more likely to make a bad decision and say, okay, I need the counterfeit because I need it quick. God's way takes too much time, right? Much more likely to make the bad decision. Number three, we're not properly dealing with conflict. The American church is not great at conflict. Most of us grew up in one of two kinds of families. The ones that talk about everything. Everything is out there on the table, sometimes loudly and angrily, right? But then they're over it and they're done and they walk away. Or the kind where nobody talks about anything, right? They hide everything, but they're a little passive aggressive about it for a while, maybe. On the surface, one of them looks more peaceful, but are they? (laughs) Whoever has been in one of those families, you know, right? Usually, by the way, people from one of each marry each other. (laughs) And that's where... So many conflict resolution situations come up. Like, one of us is yelling and one of us is hiding it all. I'm the hiding it all, by the way, just in case you couldn't tell. Uh, But uh, no matter what family you come from, you usually have trauma in your past having to do with conflict. (laughs) Because no matter what, we don't handle it well as people. Um, And I have to say there probably aren't many adults who handle conflict well. We just don't. I mean, you see it in teenagers all the time, all of the drama, all of the issues. But we don't often grow out of that. We just get quieter. (laughs) We just learn to hide it better. It's, I swear, 90% of church hurt and things that happen in churches could be avoided if we could just communicate better. We could just talk to each other. We don't, though. We gossip. We guess. We assume. We judge too quickly. We... It's overwhelming. And then we leave without telling a soul because our feelings are hurt, but we haven't told anyone. And then the poor old pastor gets hurt because we don't know why he left. (laughs) Right? And unfortunately, the, the person who gets hurt the most is the one that's not communicating. But we're so fearful. Just because things are quiet does not mean they're at peace. Real peace takes a willingness to put yourself out there a little bit. It takes a willingness to confront a thing or two. The Bible gives us so many hints at this. So, I mean, this is very, uh, it's a physical thing, but our interpersonal relationships are important to God too. We need each other. We've been placed in families, in communities, in churches. The church was important to Jesus. He invented it right? Matthew 18, I've said this already throughout this sermon, but I, I, the series, I don't think I say it enough though. There are three or four little verses in Matthew 18 that tell us very practically exactly how to handle what another believer seems to sin against you. Do you remember this? Number one, go to them first. Don't go to everybody else. Don't go to all the people in your home group. Don't tell everybody about it in your kids ministry Facebook. Good Lord. (laughs) Don't tell everybody. Go to them first. And I will tell you, I've done, practiced this for so many years. Pastor Marvin used to drill this into us. How many of you remember Pastor Marv back in the day? Drill it into us constantly. I mean, like every other staff meeting, he was mentioning Matthew 18. I don't even know what else is in Matthew 18. It's just these verses for me. Matthew 18, it says first, go to the person. Go directly to them. Talk to them about it. I cannot tell you how many situations this fixes. 
My guess is 95%. It fixes almost every time because you assumed something or they assumed something or just looking in their eyes, you can see that they regret what they did and, and it, just, it just fixes it. By the way, don't do this via text or email. It's not, doesn't count. It's not the same thing. Call them if you have to. So at least then you can hear inflections of the voice. <laughs> but see them in person and don't wait. Don't wait. We're afraid. We don't want to do this. This is scary. They might reject me. They might be mean. They might, I might have made a mistake. I don't know why we're scared of it. But we're so scared of it that we wait. And then it festers. And we begin to talk to other people. Or we begin to get bitter. Or we don't want to come to church anymore because we have to face it. We don't want to face it. Face it. <laughs> Ask them a question. It's not that scary. Right? The second thing Matthew 18 says, by the way, is if that doesn't work, which is rare, but if it doesn't work, take a second person with you so that everything you can be said, that everything that is said can be confirmed by two or three witnesses. I have this language almost memorized <laughs> because of how much this was drilled into us as a church staff under my dad and Pastor Marvin. Almost always... <laughs> then it's fixed there. When a group, a small group of people can talk about it in person or you know, over the phone, it's fixed almost every time. If it's still not fixed, then you take it to the church and have somebody else help you walk through this, right? If it's still not fixed, don't you love how practical the Bible is? Treat them like a pagan or tax collector, which is not to say be mean to them, by the way. Maybe don't trust them anymore because they don't live by the same guidelines you do. Right? Pagans or tax collectors are not to be rude to. They're to love still. They're human beings. But we don't trust them quite the same as somebody who shares our beliefs. Right? That is Matthew 18. When I say Matthew 18, it's doing that. It can fix so much stuff by just following the very clear instructions of the Bible, but we, we're, not, we're not properly dealing with conflict. There is this, I had to look it up, there's this piece of weddings that I do. I thought it was in the Bible, but it's actually a charge. You know, the charge to the couple, and now I charge you both in the sight of God and these witnesses. There's this piece of the charge that always comes to mind when I talk about peace. And I love saying it to couples. It says, I charge you to take these vows with care and to determine yourself to create circumstances that you can walk together on in peace with love and in the places where Almighty God is pleased to bless. To determine yourself to create circumstances that you can walk together on. If that's not the shoes of peace. <laughs> and most of us go into conflict Wanting to hurt the other person, not create circumstances we can walk together on. We go into conflict saying, you hurt me and now I want to hurt you back. We look for things. Well, yeah, I might have done that, but you do this all the time. Don't tell me you don't do that. You're too quiet. <laughs> there were no amens on that one. We go into it making more of a mess. The idea is to create a circumstance you can walk together on. The idea is to be friends at the end of it. <laughs> Go into it wanting to create a friendship. Not just wanting to be heard or get your point across. I want to resolve this with you. I want to be friends with you. Help me understand. Let's, can we figure this out? Right? I feel like you hurt me. You, you sinned against me. You wronged me in some way. How did you see what happened, <laughs> right? Oftentimes, you'll be very surprised by the answer. Create circumstances you can walk together on in peace with love and in the places Almighty God is pleased to bless. That's my charge to you today, all right? Number four, when we feel fear or anxiety, we're taking authority and we're casting it out. <laughs> Again, not something we're doing well as the American church. Because I talk to so many of you who feel fear in your house and instead of casting it out, squaring your shoulders, standing up and doing something about it, 
You're like, oh, I don't know what to do. Shaking in your boots, hiding under the covers. Hiding under the covers. <laughs> Take authority in Jesus' name. You are not a victim. As a believer in Jesus Christ, you have been given all authority. Take it. Stop pretending you don't have it. Stop being a victim. This is where, the, you know, things like the 40 I am's come in. We haven't talked about this in a while, but there are 40 I am statements in the Bible that you can claim, you should be claiming, you should be understanding at the very least. I am a child of God. I am redeemed from the hand of the enemy. I am more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. I am forgiven, not forsaken. I am a new creature in Christ. You can't condemn me, Satan. You don't have the right, right? These are the things, this, this declaring these things over yourself teaches you to stand up a little bit. Suit up, for goodness sake, Right? Don't take it lying down. I am strong in the Lord and the power of his might. I am kept in safety. I am blessed going in and blessed coming out. That's who you are in Christ Jesus. Luke 10, 19 says, look, I've given you authority over all the power of the enemy. Exercise that power. Use it. When you feel that fear coming on you, stand up, say, not today, Satan, okay? I'm not doing it. Seriously, it's so practical, but we don't do it. <laughs> we're, we're, we feel this presence in our house, this fear that wants to come on us. And, and as we're laying down at, in bed at night, there's like a monster under your bed. You, you feel it. I know you do because I have people come to me all the time saying, I had this awful dream, but it felt so real. You're going to think I'm crazy, but I'm experiencing this. No, I don't think you're crazy. It's real. What do you feel like it is? Because our spirit can often tell, and we want to second guess it away. We want to think it's not that, it's something else. I just saw something out of the corner of my eye. You even heard my story. I did that, right? I saw, felt something in my house. I kept saying, ah, it's just me. It's a trick of the light. It's my whatever. No, it was something sent from the enemy, and I needed to stand up and cast the thing out. I have that power. Why am I not taking it? Get up out of your bed like Aaron did. You remember the story, marching around his house in his underwear. You don't have to be in your underwear. <clears throat> in fact, maybe not do that part, but the rest of it, right? <laughs> like you own the place, march around, take authority. You have been given it by Jesus Christ. Claim it. Walk in it. He didn't die on that cross for you to hide in fear. You didn't work this hard to get this free to still be bound by fear. God gives peace, but we have to maintain it. God gives peace, but it doesn't mean you always feel it. I cannot tell you how many times in my life God has been pushing me to, do, to step out in faith, to do something else, and I'm like, God, oh, I'm still scared. <laughs> trust that you're saying this, but I don't trust me. Right? Like, I, how do I do this? I'm still scared. And God says, do it afraid. Get out there. <laughs> I've anointed you. I've sent you. Go do it. And when I do, it works out. But it doesn't mean I'm not afraid when I do it. I just overcome that fear. Take on his authority, not my own. Not walking in my own. I'm walking in his. This is another one I added this morning, and I'm going to get through these last two real quickly. But we are spreading the good news, not the bad. It's another way we maintain peace. So many Christians on Facebook, mostly. But so many Christians are doing this badly. We spread the bad news. We love to tell people the bad news. We tell them how judged they are and how wrong they are and how their theology is way off base and all this nonsense. We want to beat other Christians down for some reason. Spread the good news. It's good news. Tell people God loves them, not that he's angry at them. This is how we walk in peace. There's this common saying I see on the internet right now that says there's no hate like Christian love. <laughs> Ouch. There's no hate like Christian love. 
We're good at judging. We're good at hating. We're good at raining down fire and brimstone. That's not what Jesus called us to do. That's not why God sent him. Spread the good news. And that brings me to number six. We are one unified church. One unified church. A unified church is so powerful. And there are so many verses in the Bible about living in peace with one another. Our love will show the world his love. Our love will show the world his love. The way that we love each other. When we lay down our selfishness, our fear, our doubts, our gossip, our judgment with each other, when we love each other, serve each other well, that's spiritual warfare right there. When you can come into the house of God and be reminded how big he is, how amazing he is, we, we can carry each other's burdens, right? We, we break down walls, we encourage each other, and we call each other out when it's necessary too. I've been declaring this for months now, but this will be a house of freedom and a house of peace. It's what a healthy home should be. No underlying tension or fear. It's freedom and peace. It's what God has called us to. And so far we've talked about the defensive, the maintaining peace in your life. There is one more piece to this that kept scratching in the back of my mind all week, and that's the good news piece of this. Verse 15 says, for shoes, put on the piece that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. Fully prepared for what? Right? For shoes, put on the piece that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. There is a specific piece that comes from knowing the good news. The good news is that Jesus came for you, right? That, that you and me, sinners, can have access to the God of heaven and earth, that he wants to know us and be known by us, that his kingdom is here and now, not just later and somewhere that I can access, that, that I don't have to be bound to this fear and oppression and anxiety and worry and stress anymore, that I can have his peace. That is good news good news. So many Christians forget this vital piece of information. They begin to believe that Christianity is bad news, that it's judgment, it's God's anger. That I can never measure up. You can never measure up. Right? Jesus gave you his peace and his righteousness. We get to put that on like clothing and walk in his covering. It is good news freedom. Stop binding yourself to things that want to kill your peace, steal your joy, and destroy your life. Be free in Jesus' name. And not just for you, but for the people around you. They need you to get free. They need your peace in their life. The gospel, the good news, it should take us places. That's why they're shoes shoes of peace that come from the good news. It, it, the gospel should take us to dark places, to sinners places, to dangerous places. We're not meant to hide away in our homes and shutter our doors and not talk to anybody for fear that their crap might come on us. We're meant to take our peace with us. We take it. We get to give it. That's why it's so vital that you get free, that you maintain peace because the world needs it. The gospel message, it's not being perfectly safe and peaceful all the time. The fully prepared piece of this verse here is about sharing that news. It's about knowing that we are always in a battle. Don't take your shoes off it and just coast along in Christianity because your peace isn't just for you. Be ready in season and out of season. Be ready to risk everything. That reckless love that we sing about sometimes that abandons all, self, all sense of self-preservation and goes after the lost. Not in a way that compromises your own Jesus-given righteousness. Jesus didn't hang out with sinners and compromise his own righteousness. He invited them into it. 
we have to live our lives in a way that maintains our peace and invites others into it. The world wants to convince you that it's the free one and that religion is just toxic and full of judgment and bondage. I'm not preaching religion. I'm preaching Jesus. We're we're not touting a ritual or a cult here or a set of hoops to jump through. We're preaching Jesus. This is good news. Not judgment and anger. God loves you. And he wants to give you his peace, his love, his joy, and his freedom. You are free in Jesus' name. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that it is so useful to teach us, to correct us, to guide us. Thank you that it sets us free. The truth sets us free. And Father, today I pray you would open up hearts and minds to you, but close it to anything that's causing us torment, fear, anxiety. Help us close those doors today firmly and not look back. Help us go home today and get rid of the things we need to get rid of and set our hearts back on you to firmly anchor our souls in Jesus Christ, the life giver, the peace giver, the freedom giver. Help us repent today of anything we need to repent of, to renounce those things that have kept us in bondage, to leave today in freedom. heads bowed and eyes still closed, I want to give you an opportunity today. An opportunity to say yes to Jesus. Yes to his freedom. Being all in to this relationship with him. And understanding what that means. If that's you today and you're in the room, you're saying, this might be my first time or maybe it's been a very long time, but I want to give my life to Jesus. I, I want to be free. I'm in. I'm all in. Would you just raise your hand right where you are? I'm going to give my life to Jesus. Anybody like that here in the room, raise your hand up nice and high. If you're watching online, you can text the number on the screen or type I'm in in the comments. We'd love to help you with that decision. Okay. Well, maybe today you're, you're just sitting here saying, you know, I know I need to go home and I need to get rid of some stuff. Maybe the Holy Spirit is sort of bringing up some conviction in your soul, some some memories of some things you've got going on at home. You need to get rid of it. You need to repent. And you need to go to God for your peace. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? I wanna I just wanna be praying for you. you. Need to go home and get rid of some stuff. Awesome. You can put those down and maybe for for you, I have one last response. Maybe you just need to start claiming that authority, walking in that authority. You've been too scared, giving in to the fear too much, and you know you need to stand up and square your shoulders and take the authority of Jesus Christ. If that's you, would you raise your hand? I'd like to pray for you. Awesome. Father, I thank you for every single hand raised. Thank you for every single move toward freedom that we are making during this series. Thank you, Jesus, for setting us free. Thank you for speaking truth into our lives. Holy Spirit, as we go throughout this week, I pray that you would just continue. Pour your love over each and every one of us. Convict us where we need convicted. Show us how to rely more fully on you, how to suit up and put this armor on and live free. In Jesus' name, amen.